Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. 72124, the voice, the voice is slowly coming back. Thank you for your prayers and concerns. I got some comments and emails. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'll go very um, calmly and not to get too loud with my big mouth. <laughs> but I still have a little bit of a throat stuff going on, so we'll get through it. Um, today's date, 721-24, 2 Thessalonians message or lesson number 107, 2 Thessalonians message or lesson number 107. Your title is a darkened soul destroys the Christian's walk. A darkened soul destroys the Christian walk is your uh, title. There's a lot of things already starting to pop off. So um, my wife had to go up to New Jersey to um, help out with the grandkids because my oldest stepdaughter had a new position, a new job. So she's transitioning and had to go to these trainings. So my wife went up there a few days ago, flew up. She's supposed to fly back today and they're already changing and canceling um, flights. And I know I spoke to one of our Robs, who's a police officer in Massachusetts, and he said he didn't get a paycheck because there was a glitch in the computer with the banking. <clears throat> so trust me when I tell you this weekend coming up in August is going to be a great time to get out and get fellowship because I think things like this, glitches in the computer, canceled flights, different things happening are going to increase as you get into late August, early September. By October, who knows what will happen, we will see. But I foresee this, and I have mentioned it to you guys many times before. <clears throat> so, please keep all that in prayer. I'm filming this on a Saturday afternoon, so that way Sunday I can sleep in, because from what my wife told me, she got a late, late flight out of Philadelphia. So my son-in-law has got to carry her from Jersey for an hour and 20 minutes over to Philly, to get a late night flight into Tampa, not Orlando, her whole schedule changed. So I appreciate the prayers, but you'll be receiving this on Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning. But that's what's been going on on top of everything else. The devil's world is very busy. <clears throat> Let's jump into it. I don't have a lot um, to pray for. We're going to pick it back up in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, we will cover what I did not finish last message, and apologies for the throat issues. Apologies. Um, I'm not really sick, sick. I had a fever about a week ago. I didn't feel good, so I was legitimately sick. I took a couple days off. I broke the fever. I felt better, but there was all kind of uh, mucus problems and sinus problems and late night coughing and early morning coughing, and it ripped my throat up pretty good. So, I still seem to have some phlegm down there. We'll get rid of it, not to gross you out, but <clears throat> I'm coming back. Pick it back up in Old Testament, Joshua chapter 7. We will cover what I did not finish last message. Again, apologies for that. I may be doing my last message before the Bible conference on Thursday, July 25th. So, I have some time to rest and also recover but also fix and edit my message and make sure my slides are well. I still have issues going on with that. I have to get the last minute preparation of my notes and the slides. And um, it's funny, my brother in Christ, James, usually sends me an email that's very uh, edifying. And uh, he usually sends an email lifting me up or giving me some good advice around the same time my wife tells me, hey, do this, this, and this. Be careful. Take care of yourself. And his email and my wife's advice almost aligned perfectly. Almost aligned perfectly. And both of them, James and my wife, had suggested making sure I'm rested, readied, and all details are taken care of. So instead of teaching to that last Sunday, and maybe even that Tuesday or whatever, I am going to have to cut it off on Thursday, July 25th, coming up this week, I think. I'll let you know for sure come Tuesday. I'll make that final decision in a few days. <clears throat> I do have a request. 
I do have a request that you folks give me input, comments and emails, input, if the sound on my messages is off or bothersome to you. Not right now, my voice is messed up. On the regular, is my sound a little bit off or echoey? I have a very generous offer uh, from a very gracious woman to buy a microphone for the setup in the office. I think my son had bought me one when I was in the camper to help me. And I tried to hook it up with the iPhone and it didn't sound different to me. Maybe I didn't know what I was doing, but input, input, input. Does the sound sound echoey or good to you on the regular? Let me know. Uh, very generous offer. I appreciate that. So let's go back to where we left off in Joshua chapter 7. Let's get ready to do the most important thing we do, which is get into the word filled with the spirit. Because in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all grow in respect to our salvation, being filled with the Spirit, filling power of the Spirit, new nature, in the word habitually. Two power options. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10, speaking to... Filling power of the Spirit, believers. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, believers, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10, the Apostle John writes, if we say we have not sinned, believer, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Excuse me. Name and sight, any known sins, get rid of the distractions. We'll keep this world in prayer, everything going on in prayer, obviously. I appreciate your prayers. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Sorry about that, folks. I'm just going to keep going because the throat. Uh, that was a salesman at my door. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, <laughs> you get what you get here. There's no glamorous, no Hollywood. <laughs> this is live Bible study, even though it's recorded. <clears throat> so, sorry about that. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting one another up in prayer. We know there's so many volatile things going on across the world, so many lies and there's wars and rumors of wars and there's just volatility and we know there's computer glitches going on now and flights and trains and buses being canceled and people's bank accounts being frozen and different things happening. Father, we realize the time we're living in we're being prepared in the, in the recent lessons here at PRB Ministry in the last six months were to wake people up as to the seeds of Satan who are in control and will not tolerate any positivity and truth going forward. So, Father, we expect the attacks. We expect the deceptions. And, Father, give us the strength to go forward in these volatile times and stand strong and not quit. Keep going forward. And Father, we're praying for the Bible conference that we go forward in our fellowship and enjoy the teaching and enjoy one another and lift each other up and be prepared for what's coming in the months ahead. Father, we pray for all these things. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry, folks. <laughs> ah, it is what it is. I don't really care about looking glamorous or sounding that good or having a professional studio. Um, I put too much effort. My whole job is studying. Teaching is a small part of it, obviously, but studying. I think many of you understand that if you've been with me 
or you've been with people in my lineage, the men of my lineage, like Pastor Bob up there in heaven, Colonel RB theme up there in heaven, or going even further back to the lineage of different men like that. It's all about the message, studying and preparing for it. So all the other little distractions and the little glossy things and music ministries and skinny jean pastors and fun stories, you're not going to find it here. This is the real. This is the raw and the real. So I do request input for the sound though. See what happens. See what happens. Now, where we left off in Joshua chapter 7, it was highlighting one of the reasons in Joshua chapter 7 I showed you it was highlighting one of the reasons Nephilim and the seeds of Satan perpetuated throughout ancient history, long after the flood. The reason was because the nation of Israel never fully wiped out all of their satanic enemies. Now, if you've been with me, that became painfully apparent in my lessons. <coughs> Excuse me. You guys bear with me. <clears throat> the reason was because the nation of Israel never fully wiped out their enemies like God told them to do. Even though God commanded them to do so, they did not always do that. There's a history of that in the Old Testament. The nation of Israel never followed through 100%. Never. In fact, on several occasions, they embraced their enemies. They enslaved them. They took pieces of their culture back to them. They took their idols back to Israel as well. A whole bunch of things they did wrong. Instead of wiping the slate clean, like God told them. <clears throat> now I got a tickle in my throat. <clears> throat> the example here is one Israeli soldier, you saw last lesson, one Israeli soldier who coveted the golden culture of the Babylonian people. That's all it was about. He coveted the gold, the wealth, and the culture of the Babylonians. Achan, in the original Hebrew, Achan, was darkened and attracted to the Babylonian culture and the wealth. Greed. Curiosity and greed. What they say, curiosity killed the cat. Amen? He knew God commanded to never, you find it in the Old Testament a lot, never to take from the pagan tribes and never intermingle with them. Warning after warning. Generation after generation. Never intermingle. Don't steal their stuff. Don't grab their idols. Don't bring anything. I don't care if it's gold, silver, whatever. Almost all the time. Maybe a rare occasion you would see God not say that. But almost all the time, don't touch anything. Wipe it out. Burn it up. Kill it all. Yet, his own lust pattern, this Israeli soldier from the tribe of Judah, his own lust patterns drove him to disobey God. How many of us this happens to? This had become a growing theme in the nation of Israel. Since the Exodus generation, looking outside the plan of God for what? Wealth, pleasure, happiness, guidance, all the things of the world. Since the Exodus generation, looking outside the plan of God for wealth, guidance, and pleasure would eventually erode the Israelites. It would bring misery and discipline. They would erode in strength and power and authority throughout the land. Israel, <clears throat> seen in the Old Testament, is often a reflection of the believer's soul in the church age. Israel is seen in the Old Testament, in most theology, this is what I believe as well, as a reflection, the whole nation of Israel, as a reflection of the believer's singular believer's soul in the church age. The lessons we can learn as a singular believer uh, about what the nation of Israel did are very profound. That simply means, what I'm saying, simply means God looks at the singular believer, church age, as he did the whole nation of Israel, his people. So how many church age believers look outside the plan of God for happiness, protection, guidance, prosperity, relationships? Think about that, church age believer. How many of us have done this? Looking outside the plan of God for happiness, protection, guidance, and prosperity. Joshua 7.22. <clears throat> Pick it up in verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath it, all the goods he took that he wasn't supposed to, hiding it. 
Joshua 7, 23. So they took from the inside the tent, brought them to Joshua, to all the sons of Israel, and they laid them out before the Lord. They didn't want one single trinket, not one single coin that came from the Babylonian culture. They wanted it all brought forth because God doesn't play games like that. The fulfillment, think about this for a minute. Put yourself in Achan's shoes. The fulfillment of that sin of stealing and hiding all those valuables probably felt good in the moment. Doesn't it always? It's often a warm or familiar feeling when we first engage in sin. Don't lie. We all would say that. Then, after the sin is committed and you sit back, then comes the guilt, shame, and consequences afterwards. But oftentimes when we're knee-deep in it, and we all have some of our favorite little sins, is a warm, familiar feeling. Later on comes the consequences, shame, and guilt. And really, it's good that you have these feelings erupting inside of you. It shows you are a believer in God. The Holy Spirit is grieving in there. It's a good sign. Not that you should get caught up in the emotional uh, chain sinning of guilt and shame and all this kind of stuff. But it's a good red flag indicator. You're a believer filled by the Spirit. You have the Trinity within you. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he or she will also reap. Right in Scripture there, it teaches us this. Hebrews eleven twenty four. 24. By faith. Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. At a point in Moses' life as a young man, believed to be maybe in his teenage years or possibly early 20s or whatever, he started to realize, I am not of Egyptian bloodline. It became painfully obvious. And he would look out the window and watch what was happening to his people. And he believed in his God. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Once he finally made a stand, that was it. Verse 25, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy, here it is right here, the temporary pleasures of sin. Sin will give you pleasure for a season. Be careful. It's very fleeting. Joshua 7, 24. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zarah, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, everything in and around his tent. His oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. They brought them up to the valley of Echor, and it's named that after this situation right here. This is right next to the valley of Jericho. It is named after calamity or trouble in the original Hebrew language meaning calamity or trouble, valley of problems, valley of calamity, valley of trouble. In fact, prophets like Hosea and Isaiah would later use this valley as a place to find peace or rest in their writings. You'd see that to find peace and rest. Where? In the valley of calamity? Achor? Oh, no, no, because only God can do what? Turn a curse into a blessing. Very interesting. People have asked that. Why do they say that when they find this out? Why does later on some of the prophets like Hosea and Isaiah say, go find the peace and rest in the Valley of Achor? Because God can take that which is criminal, that which is calamity, that which is not that wise or good, amen, and turn it into something, a curse into a blessing. Joshua 7, 25. <clears throat> And Joshua said, Why have you brought disaster on us? The Lord will bring disaster on you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. God didn't stop it. God didn't stop it. All Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Now, Achan and his family were believers by all accounts that we can tell. They all went to heaven. Loser believers, we would say. No crowns, blessings, and rewards. For the church age, we would say that. You understand the reflection? All Israel stoned them. They burned them up everything. Criminality and deception in the life of a believer can bring forth severe consequences. 
Don't think just because I'm a believer, I'm going to keep getting away with this behavior, attitude, actions, and criminality or negativity outside the plan of God day after day, month after month, year after year. There is some consequences coming. Be careful, especially if the actions of one believer will bring a curse or misery into the lives of other believers. I can almost guarantee if your negative choices are touching and going to infect other Christians and hurt them in the long run and bring misery to them in the long run, your consequences are going to be severe. Be very careful. God takes this kind of stuff very serious. <clears throat> There's a reason it's written for our example. Joshua 7, 26. Then they erected over him a large heap of stones that stands to this day. I believe this is one of the things in and around Israel that you can find. Now, obviously, I don't think it's that large, but I think the spots itself are marked off still in Israel if they haven't been destroyed. There's a lot of um, archaeology things in and around Israel that are phenomenal. Um, I've never been. <clears throat> I'd like to, but I found out from different people and researching that some of the things we read about in the Bible are still, remnants of them are still there today. Very exciting, actually. Then they erected over him a large heaps of stones. They stand to this day, and the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Everything was dealt with. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achar to this day. Folks, God is all-powerful, omnipotent, sovereign. Means his what he decides is final. He's finality. He's it. He is omniscient, meaning knows everything. He's the author of everything, as well as just and righteous. Amen? Some of his attributes, some of his essence right there. Omnipotent, sovereign, omniscient, just and righteous. God knows what is needed to wipe out evil. Don't question it. God knows what is needed to wipe out evil. He knows how to combat demonic beings and fallen angels. He's God. He created especially the fallen angels. When this world as we know it, pay attention, I'm going to make a very profound, strong statement here to knock off any silliness or questions about the wrath of God and killing Akan's whole family. He knows how to combat all of this. He knows how to deal with all of this. He's God. When this world as we know it, has spun its last cycle and the great white throne judgment materializes, everyone, 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 angel or human, will realize how fair, just, and righteous he has been. All the lies about him being injustice and unfair and cruel and that filled with wrath, it's all going to be exposed. Remember the old saying, it takes the truth. What is it? Uh, a lie goes around the world three times before the truth even puts its pants on. It's one of those old sayings, very factual. A lie goes around the world twice or three times, it says, before the truth even gets up to put its pants on. When the great white throne judgment appears, trust me, everyone will realize how fair, just, righteous God is and has been. The lies satanic lies of God being wrath-filled and unfair or callous will evaporate like that. Trust me, the great white throne judgment, because everything is exposed. All the evidence comes forward, all the discovery, like you're in the courtroom, they have to bring forth everything, all the evidence, all the discovery, along with all the facts come out. And when you're dealing with the courtroom of God... And the justice of God, it is nothing compared to our flawed systems. The arrogance and wickedness of created creatures who rebel against a fair and loving God will be so prevalent, it will resound through the universe forever. One and done. Because that's what God does. He sits tapping patiently and says, just wait. Make all the accusations you want, Satan, and your seeds. Do all this evil and manipulate and lie and throw up all these cloaks of counterfeits and everything else. Because in the end, it is going to become 
very prevalent. It's going to resound throughout the universe. There'll be no doubt. No doubt God's plan and his power were the only force to resolve evil, sin, and rebellion once and for all times. Perfect plan, perfect power. The overreaching scar tissue issue, <laughs> the overreaching issue of scar tissue on the soul is seen in one world, uh, one word, royal family. What we've been studying. I want to be able to wrap it up today. But the overarching issue of scar tissue on the soul is seen in one word, royal family. Knowledge. Knowledge. <clears throat> We're talking about scar tissue and darkness and all the results of these things of being outside the plan of God. One word, one for this overarching lessons we've been in about scar tissue and blackout. One word is what really should be seen in all this knowledge. Knowledge is what you absorb, what you study, what you hear, what helps you form opinions, norms, and standards. Knowledge. All of us. Doesn't matter if your norms and standards and opinions are skewed over time. It's because you took in some form of knowledge. False knowledge. Negative knowledge. But that's where it led you. Knowledge is what you absorb. What you hear. What you see. What you study. What you think. That which helps form your opinions, and your norms and standards. Then, the real question comes down to where are you getting your knowledge from? That's the real question. Where are you getting your knowledge from? You want to get to the core of this scar tissue and blackout? Where are you getting your knowledge from? Job 36, 12 tells us what? But if they do not listen, they will perish. Could end the lesson there. But if they do not listen, they will perish. By what? The sword. And die without knowledge. And you can replace knowledge with Bible doctrine, truth. Proverbs 19.2 Also, it's not good for a person to be without knowledge. Simple common sense. And one who hurries his footsteps errs. In other words, somebody who wants to rush through everything and not absorb everything, it's an error. Foolishness. Most people do not truly recognize their own creator. They'll look at everything else. They'll look at Darwinism and all kinds of other things. And gods and goddesses and false concepts. But they don't really truly want to recognize and get to know the one true creator. The ones who do and claim to be Christian are often wrapped up in religious systems Satanic, really, that never allows them closer to true knowledge, Bible doctrine, the mind of Christ. Sad but true. Isaiah 1 3, Hosea 6 6 on the board. Isaiah 1 3, an ox knows its owner. <laughs> Even a simple animal like that. And a donkey, its master's manger, knows where its home is. But Israel, church age believer, Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Even the ox knows its owner. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire loyalty, words of God through Hosea, rather than sacrifice. Stop making an issue out of all you do. And knowledge of God, knowledge of God, Bible doctrine, mind of Christ, rather than burnt offerings. Again, works programs. Now, obviously, they had a reason for this in the Old Testament, symbolizing the coming Messiah. But a lot of people, what they did back then in the Old Testament was go through the ritual without the reality. Knowledge, Bible doctrine, rather than all the other fluff and things you want to do. The antithesis, <clears throat> the antithesis of scar tissue in the Christian life is the existence of the edification complex of the soul. Many of you understand that, ECS. Many of you have been around for a long time. With me, my mentor and leader, Pastor Bob, the man who ordained me, or Colonel R.B. Theme. You know what the ECS is. The polar opposite, the antithesis of scar tissue in the Christian life is the existence 
of this structure, edification complex of the soul, in the soul. That is a structure of a library and a place of doctrinal strength and a relaxed mental attitude erected in your soul. It's being built right now. If you're going forward in the plan of God, it's being built one little beam at a time. Consider it like a godly library in the soul, a place where there's going to be strength that you can go and find peace and peace of mind and knowledge. Edification complex of the soul. That's what builds you up. It edifies you, lifts you up, gives you confidence, becoming who you're supposed to be in Christ. That's the structure being built. Jump over to Hosea, Hosea chapter 4, royal family. Prophet Hosea chapter 4. Hosea 4. We will close this series out by reading a few scriptures there today. We recently covered how the lungs and the soul structure operate very similarly. In other words, there's a left and right. There's a breathing in, breathing out. Lungs and the soul structure. Your soul will inhale and exhale Left lobe, right lobe. We covered this recently. Many of you understand this. That's your truth. Who truly you are is in your soul. What is the biggest part of your soul? Your mind, your thoughts. Your soul will inhale, exhale. Left lobe, right lobe. Information every day. You're either doing it now or you're... You could be sitting listening to me now, but not absorbing it. It's just going in the left lobe and spitting it out. It has to circulate between the two and find a home with faith in the right lobe. Your soul will inhale, ex exhale, left lobe, right lobe, information every day. Scar tissue cannot accumulate if real knowledge, truth, Bible doctrine, gnosis in the Greek, if it's real and true and it's doctrinal. Scar tissue cannot accumulate if real knowledge is consistently, not once a month, consistently carry through your soul. This particularly factual, very factual, when filled by the Spirit. That statement right there, scar tissue, pay attention. This is particularly factual if you're filled by the Spirit. Scar tissue cannot accumulate. You don't have to worry about it. If real knowledge, truth, Bible doctrine is consistently carried through that soul. This is particularly factual when filled by God, the Holy Spirit, new nature. Epinosis is the end result we can call wisdom. Epinosis, wisdom, divine wisdom, is what truly escalates the construction of that edification complex. You want to build it up even more and stronger? towards spiritual maturity. Epinosis, wisdom, divine wisdom, is what truly escalates the construction of the edification complex. It is Bible doctrine applied with faith, obviously. It is Bible doctrine fully digested with faith and understood, accepting it. It is Bible doctrine changing you. You don't change the word. It's Bible doctrine changing you Driving you into your position, new nature, in the temporal. It is Bible doctrine applied with faith. It is Bible doctrine fully digested. You're not regurgitating it back out and saying, eh, I believe it, but not all the time. No, you get off the fence. Fully digested with faith. It is circulating in there. It is Bible doctrine changing you and driving you into your position, new nature, in the temporal life. You can experience, you can taste your position in heaven. A little bit here and there and more and more as you mature, obviously. Epinosis, divine wisdom, call it what you'd like, forms the foundation for real problem solving in your life. Real problem solving. Divine wisdom brings grace orientation, mastery of the details of life, a relaxed mental attitude, the capacity to really love people, and maintaining an inner happiness, which is really contentment. I'll say it again. 
Divine wisdom, epinosis, is the foundation for real problem solving. So divine wisdom is what brings forth grace orientation to life. It makes you master all these details of life. They don't overcome you. You start to have a real relaxed mental attitude no matter what. You have a capacity for real friendship, real relationships, real love, virtue love. And you're able to maintain this contentment, which is a inner happiness, no matter what. <clears throat> now, Micah and Isaiah were prophesizing in the southern kingdom of Israel in or around the same time Hosea was prophesizing in the northern kingdom. Many of you understand that. Micah and Isaiah were prophesizing in the southern end, southern kingdom of Israel, in and around almost the same time, I think give or take about seven or eight or ten years. The same time, they kind of overlapped. Hosea was prophesizing in the northern kingdom. So, the layers to these prophecies cover Babylonian captivity, obviously, and a look ahead into the future tribulation as well. More specifically, and pay attention to this, some scholars believe... It points to a time just before the tribulation. I believe this as well. More specifically, not just the tribulation, more specifically, it may highlight a point of time right before the tribulation. A few teachers, theologians, believe it may highlight a time just before the rapture. I am inclined to believe or think that. Therefore, there are some things here that you should look at and say, will this happen before the rapture? Because the rapture has to happen right before the tribulation. Hosea 4.1. <clears throat> Hosea 4.1. Listen to the word, Bible doctrine, mind of Christ, of the Lord, you sons of Israel, church age believer, because the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of this land. For there's no faithfulness, nor loyalty, nor knowledge of God in the land. This is written in the original Hebrew like a courtroom proclamation, like a legal standard, which points to divine discipline. And we know that. There are five cycles, and we know Israel brought on the fifth cycle, and it completes in the seven-year tribulation. Notice what God wants. Notice what God wants because many things do not change from one dispensation into the other. If you're under the right teaching, a God-ordained man of God who really studies, you'll understand this, how dispensations have some similarities and some changes. Loyalty is not in the original context. It is the Hebrew word for hased. Loyalty is not in the original context. It's a Hebrew word for mercy, really. Hased, mercy. Then faithfulness. And listen to the word and gain knowledge of God. Mercy, which means a kindness, which means you're operating in the right love. Mercy, love, faithfulness. Listen to the word, gain knowledge. Right there. Mercy means virtue, love. Godly love, impersonal, unconditional. Kindness. Because Israel was now partaking in pagan cultures and Baal worship. They lacked kindness. They lacked love. They lacked mercy. They were no longer faithful to Yahweh. Darkness was in their souls. Our subject matter. No knowledge of God. You want darkness in the soul? Start removing that knowledge of God. Darkness was in their souls. No knowledge of God. Lack of studying the word. Lack of studying the word. You know what they had a lot of? A lot of ritualistic behaviors, a lot of intoxication, a lot of sexual perversion, a lot of other distractions in the cosmic system. But not the word, not a true study of the word. Hosea 4, 2, they had a lot of emotional nonsense. Not too different today. Hosea 4, 2. There is oath-taking. That's really powerful because it means you're using God's name and really what it means in the Hebrew. Denial, murder, stealing, and adultery. 
They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. It's continual in their sacrifices, in their lifestyles. They're just like all these Baal cultures out there. The nation of Israel had sinned against God's love, really. God loves Israel. God loves all believers. They had experienced Yahweh's election, his provisions, his protection, and more of his blessings than any other people on the earth. This is why when somebody tells you, if I could see a miracle, if Jesus would come down and talk to me, if this would happen, that would happen, then I would believe that I would be more serious with God. They don't know their Bible. Nobody saw, who, who saw more miracles than the Exodus generation? <clears throat> who saw more miracles than, the, than the, the groups that were around the apostles when Christ was walking on the earth in front of everybody? Don't buy the lie. <clears throat> the nation of Israel had sinned against God's love. They had experienced Yahweh's election, his provision, his protection, and more of his blessings than any other people on earth. But they had walked away from him and spent his gifts. The breath you breathe is his gift. The talent you have is his gift. The IQ you think you're so great about and use is his gift. They had spent his gifts to them to satisfy their own fleshly desires. Their own fleshly desires. They had habitually chased after the God, small g, of the cosmic system. Really, fallen angels and Nephilim, if you've been with me, you understand that. It doesn't matter what you see around now. The symbolism of them may be in Hollywood or some politically elite or some wealthy CEO, the symbolism is there. They had habitually chased after the God, small g, of the cosmic system, fallen angels. They had used Yahweh's name in rituals outside the temple, oath-making and oath-taking. That's truly using God's name in vain, not just a swear word. That's a misconception. They had used Yahweh's name in rituals and promises outside the temple. Blood sacrifices and sexual perversions all revolving around the black magic, blood sex money magic of the Baal system. This is very often directed at a client nation unto God, what we're going to look at here. Because Israel is a client nation. This is very often directed at a client nation unto God who keeps rejecting Bible doctrine. America is seen in the analogy of this prophecy. Did you know that? I believe it is. I, I, I'm not alone, obviously. They had not only committed spiritual adultery, but they had become spiritual prostitutes. They took it one step further. They had sinned against his love, against his light, against his word, against his truth. And they were even doing certain rituals just to show that, yeah, we're still part of Yahweh's clan, but we do this over here. We're going to add this in. Hosea 4.3 Therefore the land mourns and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the animals of the field and the birds of the sky and even the fish of the sea disappear. God starts to remove himself from that land. There's a doctrine of blessing by association and there's a doctrine of cursing by association. Sad but true. Do I understand all the aspects of that? No, I don't. But I can tell you, be careful who you marry, be careful who you allow close, because there is a doctrine of blessing by association and cursing by association. Hosea 4.4 4. Yet let no one find fault, let no one rebuke, for your people are like those who contend with a priest. No one's at fault. He's actually calling out the priests and prophets here, the spiritual leaders. Hosea 4, 5, so you will stumble by day. And the prophets, spiritual leaders and teachers, will also stumble with you by night. And I will destroy your mother. Pretty powerful statement here. Again, a lot of this has legal connotations to it. The people and spiritual leaders were each going astray. 
often the priests and prophets did their dirty work behind closed doors and in the dark of night. That's what it means. They were good at hiding it, and then in daylight they could do certain ritualistic things and look like oh-so-holy men of God. Folks, God is not mocked. What you sow is what you reap. And there is nothing that he does not see. It is all laid bare for the God who created us. The people and spiritual leaders each were going astray. Often the priests and prophets did their dirty works behind closed doors in the dark of night. Remember something, folks. As goes the church, so goes the nation. As goes the church, so goes the nation. When a nation goes into this direction, the family unit and the mothers suffer because of the rebellion of the younger generation. Think about that. It affects everybody. It's a curse of, of association. Some theologians, and I believe this as well, some theologians reference the female goddess, I've covered this with you guys before, as the mother that God will destroy. Again, a dual meaning in prophecy. So not, not only does the mother being destroyed speak to how the family unit is falling apart, but some theologians, and I believe this, reference the female goddess, I've covered some of these things with you guys in the past, as the mother that he will destroy. Again, dual meanings in prophecy. Prophecies are like layers. There's a lot to them. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, client nation unto God. America being the last client nation unto God. You may want to heed this. My people, verse Hosea verse six, 4, 6, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of music ministry, lack of fun stories, lack of big buildings with people getting all emotional. No, lack of knowledge. Being serious students of the word, Bible doctrine. Since you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest, Israel. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, commands, word, I also will forget your children. In other words, this is going to affect future generations, Israel. Accurate Bible doctrine is no longer a priority for the priest and the people. Israel is warned right here. A time is coming. You know what that warning is? A time is coming, church age, when you will not be the ones promoting and holding my word. It'll be predominantly Gentiles, church age, after the cross. Accurate Bible doctrine is no longer a priority for the priests and the people. Israel is warned right here. A time is coming, church age, dispensation, when you will not be the ones promoting my word. This is true blackout of the soul because the emotional revolt of the soul ensues. Emotional revolt starts to happen. After enough scar tissue and things get black enough, emotional revolt of the soul, it becomes obvious. We're going to close with a look at these signs. The emotional revolt of the soul from continued negative volition is now characterized by several things, and I'll show you what they are. You might want to pay attention. If you see any of these and they touch you in any way, and God the Holy Spirit is convicting you, not condemning you, convicting you, then you might want to reevaluate how serious you are in the word. You take it and run with it how you want. <clears throat> what did I tell you about apathy being the devil's playground? Absolutely is. Indifference or apathy toward Bible teaching. Indifference or apathy towards Bible teaching. Oh, I'm going to skip it today. I'm getting tired of that same old stuff. Okay. These are red flags, folks. Indifference or apathy toward Bible teaching. Bible study habits peel off and change slightly at first. Just going to study one hour a week. I was doing like three or four. Just going to put aside one hour. A little bit busy. I'll get back to it. Okay. Occupation with the things of life. Cosmic system. Cosmic distractions. We all have them. Your own family and relationships 
husbands and wife can become distractions if you're not careful. If your priority, if your vertical is not in order, your horizontal relationships will eventually have problems. Occupation with the things of life, cosmic distractions, to the point that there is little or no time for a Bible teaching. Notice how it just peels away at a little bit at a time. Little or no time for Bible teaching. I just can't squeeze in out of the 24 hours that God gifted me today. I can't squeeze in even 45 minutes, man. Don't have time. Folks, there is no job, no wealth, no relationship worth allowing scar tissue in your soul. Let me say that again. Another good bumper sticker. There is no job, no wealth, no relationship worth allowing scar tissue into your soul because recovery can be a long road. It's there, but it may not happen overnight. <clears throat> Here's another strong sign. You're starting to revolt in your soul. Antagonism or frustration toward the subject matters or topics of Bible study. I hate that one. I'm going to skip that. That one made me feel bad. He must have been talking about me. I'm so upset. I'm going to skip the next week. Antagonism or frustration toward the subject matters or topics of Bible study. I had somebody click on brand new, and I have a feeling I know who she is because she came through somebody else. Click on brand new. Listen to two messages. The second message, I said that um, people shouldn't get enamored with end time prophecies. They want their ears tickled, and all they do is come for these type of messages, then they disappear. In the comments section, she wrote, well, if you hadn't said that, I would have stuck around, but I'm not going to stick around now. What do you mean by ears tickled? That felt insulting. You should watch with your tone, Pastor. No, I shouldn't. Eh, wrong guy. Antagonism or frustration toward the subject matters of, or topics of Bible. And by the way, I'm going to miss the $2 you probably were going to send me. Sorry. Antagonism or frustration toward the subject matters or topics of Bible study. You're a little frustrated. You don't like it. Personal hang-ups toward the pastor teacher. Hypersensitivity issues. That's what this covers. Hypersensitivity issues. Personal hang-ups. His voice sounded funny. Somebody rang the doorbell at the beginning. It's too much of a distraction. I can't, I can't watch this guy. He seems a little rough around the edges. He is. Personal hang-ups toward the pastor teacher. Hypersensitive issues. Wait till you come to the Bible conference. And you'll see me with a Harley Davidson t-shirt on. Looking like I fit into the crowd. You'll be looking for that pristine pastor. He's not there. He doesn't exist. Personal hang-ups toward the pastor teacher. Hypersensitivity issues. Antagonism or conflict with others. This is a big one too. Again, hypersensitivity. Antagonism or conflict with others in the congregation, which is really strife and pettiness begin to develop in your life. You're looking for a way out, basically. Strife and pettiness begin to develop in your life. Watch out for these. These are all hypersensitivity issues. And if you're hypersensitive, something's going on. You're taking everything very subjective instead of being objective. You're in the flesh, not the spirit. The flesh is very subjective. Everything's about me. Everything hurts me. The spirit is more objective and relaxed. Relaxed mental attitude. Folks, these are all telltale signs you are slipping backward and not pressing forward. They're all telltale signs. When it comes to the pastor teacher, it is the message, not the man you focus on. If that pastor teacher is really unloading accurate Bible teaching on you. You can't, you can't kick against it with the historical context, the original language, and the theology is strong, and you're looking for an excuse to say, well, his voice, his personality, he said something that hurt my feelings. Folks, when it comes to your pastor teacher, it is the message, not the man. It is the message, not the man you focus on. You better get over yourself. Failure to apply basic problem-solving devices. Rebound and filling of the Spirit. Two power options. When those start to dissipate in your life, you're going to have problems. Refuse, because it's really refusal to take personal responsibility 
and turn, turn toward the justice of God. When you start to peel away from those two basic uh, problem-solving devices, you're going to have major problems in a short period of time. You're basically telling God you're not going to take responsibility for anything. It's very childlike. Be careful of these things. Inability. Inability to handle pressure or prosperity, either or, gets you in trouble. The distraction. Inability to handle pressure or prosperity, either one of these two seems to easily drag you away from Bible study. If you want a million dollars in the lottery tomorrow, and a lot of people say, oh, I donate to the ministry, I do this, I do that. You would be surprised. I could tell you some stories. I know some lottery winners, and I know some people that came across some form of success after they were born again and saved. And in both cases, their lives got tore up and they peeled away from God. They didn't go towards God. Inability to handle pressure or prosperity, either one of these seems to easily drag you away from Bible study. The early patterns of reversionism, because then revolt, you can feel it's coming. The early patterns of reversionism, reaction, you react over everything, hypersensitive, frantic search for happiness. I need a new pastor, I need a new church, I need a new husband, I need a new wife, I need a new job. You're always running around looking for the new. Frantic search for happiness, emotional outbursts, careful of this one. I'm not talking about a little having fun with people or making a comment once in a while or somebody really attacks you, you get a little angry. I'm talking in your regular day-to-day -day walk, your regular reg regular Christian walk. Are you ha having a lot of emotional outbursts, anger, frustration, um, sadness, hypersensitivity. If they are permitted to continue owning space in your soul, Justification or rationalization cover these early patterns, giving them greater room. So you go from having them gain, gain more room in your soul. All of these things I'm showing you. Reaction, frantic search for happiness, emotional outbursts, hypersensitivity. Now they're gaining a foothold in your soul. What's the next step? You either clean them up quickly and get on a steady diet of Bible doctrine and fill with the Spirit. Or you start to justify and rationalize your behaviors, which covers these early patterns up, giving them greater room to get roots in your soul. Careful. The roots grow quickly. We're getting ready to wrap it up. <clears throat> the negative volition produces a vacuum which begins to look toward cosmic solutions and human viewpoint, pushing Bible doctrine to the back of the soul structure. Years. <clears throat> the negative volition eventually produces a vacuum. We've talked about these things, which begins to look toward cosmic solutions, human viewpoint, pushing Bible doctrine to the back of your soul. This vacuum is the source of setting up all false viewpoints about life. All the falseness, all the lies, all the counterfeits. It is known as a demonic or demon influence for the believer in contrast to demon possession for the unbeliever. It's demon influence. When you get all of these false doctrines, false concepts into the staging area, they immediately move, move over to the right lobe. Therefore, the blackout of the soul becomes evident and this revolt just keeps building. It's like a snowball going downhill. This will heighten emotional revolt of the soul to become an incredibly negative force in your life. Incredibly negative. It will be your new problem-solving devices. You'll switch from God's problem-solving devices to cosmic system and emotional and human viewpoint problem-solving. Norms and standards will shift backward to when you were an unbeliever. Pay attention to what I'm saying in closing here. It will be new problem-solving devices, no longer doctrinal. Norms and standards will shift backward to when you were an unbeliever or, maybe worse, 
shift in a direction aligning with the New Age movements of the cosmic system. Now that believer is actually aligning more with all the New Age nonsense out in the cosmic system. The social justice and all the nonsense. Now everything is wrapped up in that. Be careful, folks. I warn you, and I thank you for your time and tolerating the voice and the distraction. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.